All right. Good to see you all. Um, something you might not know about us Finns is that we're not known for our many words, so let's just get right to it. <laughs> let's open to First John uh, chapter 2. Let's just read the passage first, because uh, John is a bit complicated, as we saw yesterday, and I think it, it helps to um, kind of, before we dive into the first words and start going through this systematically, to just have a kind of bird's eye perspective on the passage itself. So today's passage is First uh, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. I'll be reading from the ESV, by the way. I don't know if that makes it... I probably should have told you that before. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, First John chapter 2, verse 1. John writes, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Let's pray quickly one more time. Lord, thank you for your word. It is your holy word. Help us now, Lord, to submit ourselves under it and just let your word examine us. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us. Speak just now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so, like Bob already mentioned yesterday, this epistle, it is a challenging one um, for various reasons. And one thing that generally helps me in studying and what I often like to do when trying to understand a passage of scripture or a book, for that matter, uh, is to summarize. I like, I like summaries because I guess I'm a simple man. I like just putting it simply. So how could you sum up this letter uh, or you know, an individual passage in one simple sentence? There, of course, isn't just very seldom there's a right, one right answer to that. Uh, you can summarize a passage in many different ways. And summaries obviously fall short in that they fail to capture like 99% of the actual depth of the text. But I still find that it helps to give some kind of bearing, some kind of direction, uh, especially when you're dealing with a difficult text like we have today. So if you wanted to summarize First John, one way that you could do that would be to say that John presents to us in this epistle the hallmarks of a Christian, the characteristics of a Christian. What does a Christian look like? And specifically, someone who isn't just a Christian by name, but someone who deeply and genuinely loves the Lord, 
whose life is oriented toward serving him and following him, someone who knows the Lord on an intimate and personal level. So what John's going to do in this epistle is he's going to give us specific characteristics of what a Christian looks like. He's going to, also going to dispel some uh, false ideas that people might have regarding what a Christian looks like. And this desire of John to do this seems to stem from a real and practical problem that was facing the believers in that, uh, well, the specific community he's writing to, but also the church in general in John's day. Bob already talked about this yesterday, but there were heresies rising in the church. There were false teachings creeping in. Of course, this is a very, the church is still very young. Uh, this is towards the close of the first century. So the, the church is spreading very fast. Uh, churches are being born all over the place. And of course, it also often brings in its wake just weird teachings, weird people trying to creep in and, and bring all kinds of heresies in. And it appears that the community of believers that John is writing to had some who supposedly had been believers, but had then at some point left the faith. In fact, John calls them antichrists, which suggests to me that they hadn't just left the faith. They were some who, in, in some way, they turned hostile to the faith and hostile to the church. So this was a very burning question for this community, seeing these people who they thought were believers, but then had gone uh, and seemingly turned hostile the question then arises, if they weren't believers, then, then who is? What is a Christian? As false teachings are on the rise and wolves are keep creeping into the church as well, it raises the very natural question of who then is true. If there's so much false and so many lies and, and so many wolves, then what is true and who is true? What does a true born-again believer look like? What are the characteristics that mark someone who walks in the light as the Lord is in the light, as we read in uh, chapter 1, verse 7? So these are the questions that John tackles in this book, among other things. So that means that if you're someone who loves the Lord, if you're someone who wants to know him personally and to grow in that knowledge day by day, then we should, we should be excited about this book because that's a question that should interest all of us deeply. Wh who is the kind of person uh, who walks in the light? And, yeah, what is a Christian? Uh, we, we would like to know that, because that's what we want to be. If you're someone who isn't uh, content with simply being a Christian by name, but you desire the deep inward reality as well, then this is a book for us. This is like a step-by-step -step book almost. Uh, many today, as in John's day, so today I think many have a very convoluted idea of what true spirituality, if you want to use that word, means, what it means to be uh, a real believer, you know. So in this passage today, we're going to see two of these marks or characteristics. First one is obedience. Someone who walks in the light is marked by obedience to the Lord. That's in verses 3 through 6. And the second characteristic is love, and specifically love toward the brothers or sisters, love toward the saints. That's verses 7 through 11. And before we get to it, I want to point out a few things a few general things about John as an author that has helped me to understand this book better. And I hope that maybe it might help you as well, because it is tricky in some ways, at least this book. Like we've already pointed out, John has a very unique style of writing compared to, for example, to Paul. So a couple of things that have helped me. First off, John's perspective in writing seems to be very practical for the most part. When he speaks of ideas like knowing Jesus or being in Jesus, he seems to be speaking of a very practical experience. 
To know Jesus and to be in him means for John to enjoy unbroken fellowship with him in your normal day-to-day -day life. It means that you don't let sin sort of hinder that relationship, that there's a, there's a daily communion, there's this sweetness uh, in your daily life with the Lord. It seems like for the most part, John isn't really speaking so much of our positional standing in Christ. In fact, for the most part, he seems to assume that his audience consists of born-again believers. So he seems to be speaking of experiential knowledge of Jesus. This is, I think, important to note because it's very different from, for example, Paul and Paul's use of similar terms. When Paul speaks about being in Christ, he usually refers to our positional standing in Christ. I mean, Romans 8.1 as an example there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Or Philippians 3, 8 and 9, Paul writes, for his, sake, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. So you see that for Paul, being in Christ is this huge theological concept. Uh, whereas for John, he seems to be speaking on a very practical level. This is a good thing to note in general as we study scripture. It's very important that we recognize the different ways that um, the different authors might be using the same words or same phrases. And I think that's especially true in John's case. Second thing that has helped me and hopefully will help you is to realize that John is a very contemplative and poetical writer even. Again, Bob talked about this yesterday, but in order to illustrate what I mean by this, let's just use Paul again as a contrast. As you know, Paul is a very structured and logical writer. When he writes, there's a clear progression of thought. There's a, he carefully builds his arguments piece by piece. He lays out the groundwork. He, he establishes sort of the basis, and then he starts building on that. Since this is true, then it follows that this is also true. It's like this building that Paul builds layer by layer. A lot of his writings, I mean, Romans is a shining example of this. Well, John is almost the complete opposite. Instead of this clear logical progression, John writes in cycles, as was already mentioned. He speaks about one thing, then he moves on to talk about another thing. Then he comes back to talking about the first thing, to then only go back to talking about the second thing. This is, he's very cyclical. He jumps from topic to topic. He's not so concerned with this kind of overall logical structure of his epistle. And he also writes very poetically. He often repeats himself. He uses figurative language like light and darkness. I mean, that's in this epistle, comes up a lot. He conveys the same basic idea in many different ways, each time adding another layer of detail or each time approaching it from a little bit of a different perspective in order to kind of shine light on a different angle. It's like he communicates through beauty and poetry rather than just straight up reasoning and argumentation. I mean, if you want to like really, maybe that's uh, putting it too bluntly, but anyway, I think it's true for the most part. So if we appro approach John too analytically, if we try to pick his writings apart word by word and examining them all under a microscope, there's a big danger that we might actually miss the message that he's trying to convey. I think that's probably the reason, like you mentioned that many commentators, I was really happy to hear that by the way, that many commentators think it's a difficult one too, because man, uh, maybe that's why, because what commentators usually do is that's exactly what they do, like analyze the entire, take it, take it apart piece by piece and analyzing every word, what does this mean? And there's a real danger of missing the forest for the trees if we do that too much with John. And, and we're going to see that even in the passage today. In fact, all these things we're going to see in our passage today, and no doubt many times over, 
in the following sessions as well. But that's just to hopefully help you a bit as we navigate through this book together. Because, um, yeah, I'm sure I'm definitely not the only one who's been left scratching my head um, as I've been reading this letter. So anyway, chapter one ended by John talking about the importance of not pretending like we can be sinless. He said in verse eight, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, perhaps there were some in the church who had claimed sinless perfection, at least to some degree. So as far as the hallmarks of a Christian goes, or the marks of a Christian, John was teaching that sinless perfection is not one of them. If you want to know what a Christian looks like, sinless perfection is not one of those things. But rather, it is the humble recognition of sin. It is repentance. It is rejoicing in forgiveness, which marks a true Christian. So that, I guess you could say, was the first mark of a Christian. And now in the beginning of chapter 2, he develops that thought further. Verse 1 of chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So he begins by saying, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. John wants to be absolutely clear that even though, as he stated very clearly, just in the verses prior to this, even though we can never attain sinless perfection in this life, someone who claims to not have sin is a liar, even still, the Christian is called to holiness. The Christian is called to forsake sin. These two ideas are in no way contradictory, even though we might easily perhaps think that way. When we as believers understand the wickedness of our sin and the price that Jesus paid in order to deliver us from our sin, the only natural response is a desire to turn from sin and to pursue holiness. Also more importantly, when we receive the grace and forgiveness of Jesus, when we are born again, we are given a new nature, new life in Christ, and that new nature is oriented toward righteousness, whereas in the past we were oriented toward sin and the flesh. So because of these things, the Christian call must always be and can only ever be, do not sin. This is not contradictory with grace and with forgiveness. Rather, it stems directly from it. We see this clearly in the ministry of Jesus. In John chapter 8, we have the story of the adulterous woman that is brought to Jesus by the scribes and Pharisees in order to test Jesus. Now, for the purpose of this point I'm making, let's just ignore the Pharisees. Let's just ignore the scribes and the whole game that they're playing to try to uh, capture Jesus in his words. Let's just focus on the simple fact that this woman is brought before Jesus and there she stands in front of the Lord. She is guilty. There's no way out of it. The text tells us that she had been caught in the act. She's guilty. So what does Jesus tell her? After the whole episode with the scribes and the Pharisees, when they have left, and it's just Jesus and the woman, it says in John chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, it says, Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. What a vivid example of that. Jesus showing incredible grace and mercy toward this sinner. And that mercy and that forgiveness is followed immediately by a call to holiness. We also see this in John 5, where after showing mercy to the lame man by healing him, uh, him at the sheep gate pool. Jesus tells him later in John chapter 5, verse 14, see you are well, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Even there, there's this grace extended to this <clears throat> poor man and it is followed by a call to holiness. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 14, very explicitly, he says, 
As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We as Christians were called to holiness. Our constant need for grace and our daily need for forgiveness, that kind of rinsing and washing that Bob talked about yesterday, it does not change that call. In fact, if it does anything, it magnifies the call. When we know the love and grace that our Lord has shown toward us, how could we then respond by willingly sinning? Those who erroneously think that God's grace somehow gives us a license to sin or somehow makes sin less serious, they fatally misunderstand both grace and sin. But even still, we're called to holiness, but even still, sin remains a reality in our lives. And because of that, John continues, after saying, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I mean, there's so much in these two verses, uh, but we have to get to verse 14, so let's try <laughs> um, keep it condensed. So first of all, we notice that there's no downplaying of sin of any kind. John doesn't write, but if anyone sins, don't worry about it. We all do it anyway. It's not a big deal. He doesn't say that because sin is a big deal. Sin is abhorrent to God. Sin is why Jesus suffered on the cross. Sin is what ultimately will damn sinners. And sin is also what breaks fellowship between God and his children. Sin is an extremely serious matter. And John doesn't downplay sin. So instead, what does he do? He points to Jesus. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, advocate here, the Greek word for advocate translates the word parakletos, which you might be familiar with from different contexts. In this context, it speaks of a legal defender. That seems to be the image that uh, John is portraying here. Someone who speaks on behalf of, of the accused in a court setting. So who is our advocate? It says, he's Jesus Christ, the righteous. What an awesome title to Christ. When we have experienced conviction of sin, when we're faced with our own unrighteousness, we can take comfort knowing that our advocate before the Father is righteous. Our case is not dependent on us being righteous because if it were, we'd all be in deep trouble the one who defends us, the one who speaks on our behalf, he is righteous. So the focus shifts from the one who has sinned, the one who is unrighteous, to the one who has done righteously and who now advocates for us. This is why we're called uh, in Hebrews 4.16, I believe it is, to come boldly to the throne of grace. We can come boldly because it is not on our merit that we come, but his the one who speaks for me, the one who defends me, is righteous. Lastly, I want to point out one more thing from verse 1. Notice that John uses the term father to speak of God. Even when we sin, he still remains our father. We, if anyone, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the father. Even when we sin, when we've sort of... Uh, dirtied our garments and we need washing, he still remains our father. It is before the father that we stand. It tells us the very precious truth that sin in a Christian's life, though it interrupts our fellowship with God, it does not change our position as his children. John then goes on to talk more about Jesus, our righteous advocate, in verse 2. He says, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
He is the propitiation for our sins. To propitiate means to appease or to satisfy. Some translations translate this as an atoning sacrifice. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Whereas in the previous verse, John seems to be portraying Jesus as a sort of like a defense lawyer, arguing our case in a court of law. Here the image shifts to that of a priest offering a sacrifice to God. The idea here is that Jesus has satisfied the claims of divine justice by offering a sacrifice, that sacrifice being, of course, himself. This means that our sins are forgiven not by God just ignoring our sins, just wiping, kind of brushing it under the carpet, but by Jesus actually taking the guilt and the punishment that we deserved upon himself. He bore the wrath of God for sin that we deserved. This is a theological concept that is very much under fire today. It is ridiculed broadly as this archaic idea of an angry God demanding a blood sacrifice, you know, something from, from I don't know, some Mayan tribes somewhere in South America hundreds of years ago. Um, and many, I think, I, I mean, it's a fact that this most definitely does not fit the modern liberal and progressive, our modern sort of sensibilities, our progressive sensibilities, this idea of a propitiation, of atoning death. And there's all kinds of attempts to sort of lessen that um, embarrassment that many feel to, to uphold this. Many, there are many attempts to try and make Jesus' death about something else than him actually propitiating or atoning for us. One of these attempts is the, to say that Jesus merely died to set an example. He only died so that we would see how much he loves us. Uh, I think that's a ridiculous idea every time I hear it. Like, how does that I sent my son to a horrible death to show you how much I care about it. It's just, it's just a weird, it's a weird way to just make an example of what, how much you love someone. Um, there are other attempts as well. But the fact is that this is the core of the gospel. If you take away Jesus' substitutionary death on our behalf, you take away the gospel itself. So this is the foundation of our relationship with God. Before we can hope to exhibit any of the characteristics or hallmarks of a Christian, we have to first actually be ones. And the only way to be one is presented to us here, by trusting in Christ who bore the penalty of our sins. So next we're going to see the first hallmark of a Christian, which is obedience. Now, both of these characteristics, obedience and love, they're going to repeat over and over and over again in this book. And each time John will reveal some new facet uh, or some new approach, some new detail about them. So this passage is more or less, it serves as an introduction to a subject that he will talk much more about uh, in the coming chapter. So we'll also try, I'll try to uh, keep it sort of on that level as well. Uh, but let's see, <laughs> verse three, he says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. I talked about John's way of writing, where he just repeats himself many times. This is a good example of that. In these verses, John basically repeats the same idea three times, each time developing the thought and adding new facets to it. Notice the differences here. First, he says in verse 3 that if we keep his commandments, we can know that we have come to know him. Then he says in verse 5 that if we keep his word, the love of God is perfected in us. Then lastly, in verse, verses 5 and 6, he says that if we walk as he walked, 
we can know that we are in him. So he describes the Christian obedience as keeping the commandments, keeping or keeping his commandments, keeping his word, and walking as he walked. There seems to be a progression here. It seems to go from kind of the simplest obedience toward the more uh, uh, mature and all encompassing uh, obedience. To keep his commandments, the first description of obedience, to keep his commandments is to obey the simple and straightforward teachings found in the Bible. Okay, you find a commandment and you keep it. Like, okay, it says, do this, I will do this. It says, don't do this, I won't do this. Keeping his word, the second description, seems to be a bit deeper. It seems to speak not just of individual uh, commandments, but the broader sort of heart behind uh, the full teaching of Christ. It speaks of obeying the entirety of his teaching, not just the simple explicit commandments, but the overall heart behind them. So instead of asking, is this thing allowed? Is it sin for me to do this? Can I do this? We ask, does this please the Lord? Is this in keeping with the heart of what the Lord is teaching us? We want to obey the teachings of Jesus in its entirety. Then lastly, to walk as he walked. This seems to speak of a whole life that is completely oriented to following Jesus. Not just doing what he commands, seeking his will for our lives, but daily presenting our entire life as an offering to him and, and directing our entire life, all that we do uh, towards following him. I think what this shows us is that obedience to Jesus which is the first hallmark of a Christian in this passage, is a calling that everyone can partake in. Regardless of your age or you know, level of spiritual maturity, if you're a young believer, there might be a lot that you don't yet understand about God or the Bible or life as a Christian. But what you can do is you can obey Christ by keeping his word. You start reading the Bible and you just simply put what you read into practice. It might be very small things at first. You might be, you know, reading the Sermon on the Mount, the passage where Jesus tells us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. Okay, do that. I'm going to pray for those who treat me poorly. John will talk more about this at the end of our passage where he explicitly emphasizes that he's writing to everyone. He's writing to everyone from children to fathers and from the youngest to the most mature. I think this is really important because often we erroneously reserve the highest calling of Christ to a small group of elite believers. We've done that throughout history. Whether it's monks in a monastery, whether it's professional clergy, whether it's pastors or missionaries, throughout history we've been really good at dodging the high calling of Christ by thinking that surely that's not for me. You know, there's the there's the special forces, the Christian special forces. That, that's for them, you know. But John seems to be saying that, no, it is for all of us. This calling to walk in the light, to remain in fellowship with the Lord, it is for everyone, regardless of where you are in your walk with the Lord. There's something, we're all called to this, and I think that's a wonderful, uh, that should excite us, because hopefully we all have a desire to know the Lord, to follow him. But, you know, we're not all as gifted as others. We're not all maybe as, uh, I don't know, social or charismatic or, or whatever. We can look, there's a lot of people that we can look at like, man, the, I, can, I can see how the Lord is using that guy because how gifted he is. But you know me, I don't know. Uh, this Christian that John is describing it is not reserved for a special class of Christians. He calls everyone to it. I think that's exciting. Regardless of who you are, what your skills are, what your level of spiritual maturity is, this is a call for you to walk in the light as he is in the light. Then let, let's look at the descriptions of what follows when we live in obedience to him. Again, in verse 3, it's said that if we keep his commandments, what happens? He says, we can know that we have come to know him. 
He repeats this again in verse 5. He says, but whoever keeps his word, uh, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So by obeying him, we can know that we've come to know him. In John's time, many false religions emphasized the importance of secret knowledge. The Gnostics certainly did. The, the name Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And in fact, the word that John uses here is the verb form of that uh, Greek word. The Gnostics emphasized knowledge a lot. Uh, but so did many of the, especially the Roman mystery religions that were <clears throat> popular in these days. According to these views, the level of spirituality uh, was determined by how much of this secret knowledge you had, how much you knew. Many commentators think that the reason John talks so much about knowing is that he was combating these false teachings. I, it wouldn't be surprising if these were creeping into the church, if this was one of the things that the Gnostics were trying to bring in. If you really want to know the Lord, if you really want to walk with him, well, there's these secrets you got to know. you gotta, you got to have this knowledge. That's what really marks a follower of Christ. Well, John is utterly rejecting this idea that possessing knowledge, secret knowledge, is a key to some kind of higher spiritual experience. There's almost a hint of, maybe not even a hint, of mockery in the way that he writes. Do you want to know that you know God? Well, keep his commandments. You want the knowledge that makes you this, this respect, this deep spiritual person who knows the mysteries of God? Keep his commandments. Obey him. It's as simple as that. Again, these false teachers were trying to reserve the highest spiritual experience to a small class of elites, those who had attained, those who alone possessed these deep secrets. But John isn't having any of it. This knowledge of God is available to all those who desire it. It's not through understanding these mysteries. It is to, by simply obeying him, which, as we just saw, is something we're all equipped to do by God's grace. And if he wasn't clear enough already, John continues in verse 4 and says, Whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Simply claiming some special knowledge, it means nothing. The only meaningful standard of our fellowship with Christ and our intimate knowledge of him is our obedience to him in our day-to-day -day lives. It's really that simple. It's not about how much knowledge I've accumulated. It's not about how, not just knowledge, I think that seemed to be the thing in John's day, but I think there's other ways that we can sort of pile on to that where we make the standard of holiness something else. It's, not, it's also not about how spiritual I can act on Sundays, how positive I can be, how, how happy I can, what a happy face I can put on on Sundays. It's not how well read I am in theology or or the Bible, for that matter, um, it's not a contest on who can recite the most verses out of memory, although don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. It's, it's a great thing. Uh, it's not about, you know, any, anything that we might do to sort of appear holy to others. It's not about how many amens and praise the Lord you can throw in in a normal conversation. But rather, a true measure of fellowship with Christ is how consistently my normal life, day in and day out, reflects the character of Jesus. That is the measure of our knowledge of Jesus and our fellowship with him. John also says there, uh, just to quickly point out, concerning obedience, that whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. In verse, verses 4 and 5, or 5. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. The idea in this verse seems to be that if we keep his word, God's love toward us has been brought to its goal. I mean, it is God's love that prompted 
God to send his son into the world to save sinners. It's God's love that draws people to repentance and faith. And it's his love that seeks to bring people back to an uninterrupted fellowship with him. So when we turn from our sins, when we trust in him, when we walk in obedience and enjoy that close fellowship, not just positionally being righteous, uh, but also relationally as well, that is when his love toward us has reached its goal. I believe that's what John means when he says that his love is perfected in us when we keep his word. This is also, he will talk about love next, so maybe this is a kind of a way to uh, build a bridge to that. So let's look at that next. John will now move on to talk about the second hallmark of a Christian, which has to do with love. Verse 7. Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. I mean, this is as typical John as it could possibly be. He's writing a new commandment, but it's not new. It's old, but it's also new. And you got to love him. Um, well, let's keep reading. Whoever says, so this is the, that's, what was, that's kind of John's introduction to this topic. And then in verse 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So it is love. That is the second hallmark of a Christian. But John introduces this section with this lengthy and poetic description of the commandment that is at the same time new and it's old. Uh, John likes this idea a lot. It's found here in 1 John. It's also found in 2 John, and it's also found in the Gospel of John. And in fact, it originally comes from the Gospel of John. It's Jesus who said in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That is where this idea of a new commandment comes. Now, I don't want to spend too much time here, so let me just summarize what I think is going on here. The commandment to love itself is not new. It's a principle that Jesus taught and clearly demonstrated from the beginning of his ministry. And it even extends all the way to the old covenant. I mean, love your neighbor as yourself is not a New Testament command. It's from Leviticus 19.18. So love as a commandment is not new. But what is new is the example that Christ gave us. John 13.34 what I just read, it, it continues that statement of Jesus. So he says there, John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So what was new in the commandment was not the commandment to love itself, but the example that would soon be given them. So in that sense, it is a new commandment. Jesus gave us an example of what it truly means to self-sacrificially love others. And you could also add on top of that, on top of the, it being a new example, that we also have new power to live out the commandment as we've been given the Holy Spirit. So that's what I think is going on there. It is old and new. So let's then look at this new commandment. What is it? Verse 9. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The first thing that I want to point out here is that as John is talking about the importance of love in a Christian's life, He's talking specifically about love among believers. Of course, we understand that we're called to be loving toward everyone. We're called to love everyone, believers and unbelievers alike. Um, but here is a, there's a special kind of calling uh, 
first Christians to love one another. In that same section where Jesus originally taught about love as this new commandment, he was also specifically talking about love among his followers. In fact, in the very next verse, Jesus says that it is specifically by our love for one another that even the world will know that we are his disciples. We need to understand this, that there is a special calling for us to love one another. Our brothers and sisters in Christ. John uses very strong language here as he describes the effects uh, of our relationships to one another. John says that if we say we're in the light, which is a way of describing unhindered fellowship with Jesus, but we hate our brother, we're actually in darkness. And in verse 11, he describes that darkness much more vividly. And he says, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, the word hatred in scripture does not have the same strong connotation as it does in English. You kind of wish it did because this would be a lot easier commandment to follow if it just meant, hey, don't despise and hate your brother, then you're doing good. Uh, but um, it's often used in the sense of disfavor rather than just like active hatred. For example, in Romans 9, 13, it is said of God, or God says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. I think it's safe to say that God did not hate Esau in the same sense that we often understand the word. Another example would be Luke 14, 26, even a clearer uh, example where Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Again, I think it's pretty safe to say that if we take scripture as a whole, we can safely say that a mark of someone who follows Jesus is not that he hates his wife and kids and his parents. Rather, we understand that Jesus here is speaking of preference or favor. Jesus must always come first, even before one's own family. Our love for Jesus should make our love for others look like hatred. But certainly we're called to love. Uh, if you're a Christian, you're called to love your wife, your called or husband, or kids, your parents, obviously. So here too, hatred of a brother should not be understood as just this active despising, but rather it should be understood as a lack of Christ-like love rather than active detesting. We shouldn't think that we're fulfilling Christ's call to love one another by simply not harboring active hatred toward one another. I think the call is a little bit deeper than that. Now, whatever else might be said of this, one thing that these verses make absolutely clear is that if we do not have Christ-like self-sacrificial love for our brothers and sisters in the Lord, we are severely hindering our own personal walk with the Lord. It is interesting that John deals with the subject of love here by focusing so much on the negative, how we harm ourselves and how we harm our fellowship with the Lord by not loving our brother. I think that is because this is what we naturally do. It's easy to harbor bitterness. It's easy to envy. It's easy to think evil of one another. These aren't skills that we need to learn, that we need to develop and discipline ourselves in. They come pretty naturally. You know, if, we, if we're not paying close heed to our heart, or maybe it's just me, but I notice like your heart so easily steers toward uh, those kinds of things. But to put off the old man, to love one another like Christ loved us. That is a conscious decision that we have to make. And it's a discipline that we have to cultivate each day. That doesn't come so naturally. Um, so I think that's why he's so much focusing on the negative. Like this is something I think we need to actively uh, cultivate in our lives. And I mean, this is a great time, great opportunity for that. These days that we're spending with each other here. It is always surprising to me 
to discover how often and how emphatically the scriptures teach on the importance of believers loving one another. Major portions of the epistles, for example, are devoted to instructing the believers on how we should relate to one another and how we should behave toward one another. That is because together we form the body of Christ and as much as we are children of God, we are also brothers and sisters to one another. And this means that our relationship to God and our relationship to one another, they are interconnected. You cannot love God while hating your brother. If you hate your brother, you're also not walking in the light uh, in relation to God either. But the opposite is also true. Verse 10 says that whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there's no cause for stumbling. Someone who loves fellow believers remains also in fellowship with Jesus and he's also protected from stumbling. Now, resentment and bitterness and all those negative things that so easily, easily bubble up in our hearts, they are very deceptive and destructive things. We might not even notice them unless we're uh, walking circumspectly regarding those things. They are stumbling blocks that so easily come up in our lives. So making sure that we let go of any hatred, we forgive wrongs done to us, we let grace cover a multitude of sins, we strive to show love to each other. These are very good ways of ensuring that we stay in the light and that we rid our hearts of any potential stumbling blocks that might so easily arise. That's why I think he says that whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there's no cause for stumbling. Now, love, as I said, is a topic that John will return to many times. In fact, he speaks of love in every chapter re that's remaining and even multiple times. And he will get into more detail as to what that love actually looks like. So we don't have to get uh, too deep into that. There's one thing I, I do want to say without spoiling uh, what's coming next. And that is to say that this love that John talks about, it's not a feeling. We do, in our modern culture, we've equated love with feelings. But did you know that the Bible never calls us to feel love toward each other? It just doesn't. There is no commandment to feel love toward one another. It would be pretty pointless because you can't really demand feelings. Feelings come and go, you know? When the Bible calls us to love one another, what it speaks of, it speaks of actions. Loving is an action. To love someone is to perform acts of love toward them. You can do that regardless of your feelings. And you know what is amazing about these acts of love? It's that anyone can do them. You don't need to be an extrovert. You don't need to be someone who just loves being around people, who loves serving people. Anyone can love uh, in, the sen in the biblical sense. Just like it was with obedience, if you are a born-again believer, you have, by the Spirit of God, all that is needed to exhibit the hallmarks of a Christian in your life. Both obedience and love. You don't need to be a special class Christian. You don't need to have some special knowledge or special people skills. No matter who you are, you can love your brothers and sisters as Christ loved us in this self-sacrificial way and by so doing you can abide in the light that should be really exciting for us John ends the passage by making this point very poetically let's just read the remainder verses 12 through 14 I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. I'm not going to go deep into these verses. We could probably spend a lot of time here as well. I just want to close with a general glance uh, of these verses. And I think 
one of the main points that, that does flow out of it. I think what we see here in this passage is that these truths in 1 John are written for everybody. You don't need to be part of some special class of Christians to understand and to apply these principles. This is written for the children, it's written for the young men, and it's written to the fathers, which encompasses all walks of life. By the way, this includes women as well, I believe. It was just normal in those days to address crowds in masculine terms. So I think this is just John's way of uh, including everybody. Notice really quickly the general terms by which John describes these three groups. He mentions all of them twice. You know that. He writes to children, to fathers, to young men, to children, to fathers, to young men. And by the way, this is a good example of the kind of like overanalyzing that I talked about in the beginning. Like you can, it's so tempting to go so deep into this. Why is he talking, why does he mention them all twice? Why does he say children and fathers and young men? Wouldn't it, be make, wouldn't it make more sense to say children, young men and fathers? Or fathers, young men and children? Why does he change the order like that? Why does he say the same thing to fathers twice? Why does he say the, almost the same thing to young men twice? And why does he say a complete different thing to young children? It, it's like, it's easy to get into this, like to almost start thinking that there's some kind of secret code here. If I can just crack, you know, some message that is hidden beneath these, this, there's some kind of mystic code here. It, we can get lost in that. I think the way to guard against that is to just step back and remember, who is John? He's a very poetical writer. He just, he loves symmetry. He loves beauty in his writings. Um, not saying that we can't go deep into these texts and discover, you know, amazing things in there. This is God's word. But just don't forget who it is that wrote these things and keep that in mind. Um, so the general terms by which John describes these three groups. He says he writes to children because their sins are forgiven for his name's sake and because they know the Father. Children whether we're talking about young age or maybe children in the faith, just young believers, they're often those whose understanding of God is very basic. Their level of theology often consists of knowing that their sins are forgiven because of Jesus and knowing that God is their heavenly father. John writes to the young men, why? Because they have overcome the evil one and because the word of God abides in them. Youth is generally marked by this kind of energetic zeal, like, yeah, let's go, let's change the world, let's just their strength to engage in spiritual battle. Let's just go for it. John writes also to the fathers, and he describes them as those uh, who know, they know him who is from the beginning. They are those whose walk is marked by this steadfast and deeply rooted maturity. Maybe that's why it's just repeated twice. There's this steadfastness. You know the one who's from the beginning. There's a steadiness, steadfastness, steadfastness and maturity there. They have this experiential knowledge of God that has, they have cultivated and has come through years of walking with him, through storms of life, through good times and bad times. The point, one of the points I think that John is bringing out here is that no matter which of these categories you belong to, the word of God calls you to walk in the light and to enjoy close, intimate and personal fellowship with Jesus. It isn't reserved for a small, specialized minority of super-Christians. So my encouragement to you is to put these principles in action. Specifically when it comes to loving one another. Like I said, we have a great chance to live that out here these next few days. Make a conscious decision. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to put my needs aside. And I'm going to bless others. I'm going to serve them any way I can. I'm going to minister to them, pray for them, just so, even if it's just showing attention, like concern for them, ask how you're doing, listen. Listening is a great way to bless, uh, bless others. Let's love one another. And also, search your heart before the Lord regarding obedience. Are you keeping his commandments? Are you keeping his word? Are you walking as he walked? Is there perhaps unconfessed sin in your life or some 
form of compromise that you've managed to try justify up until today. Repent of it today. Come to the light as he is in the light and you will discover a closeness and fellowship with God which is worth so much more than any of the passing joys that the world uh, might offer. So let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this amazing epistle and Lord, the, the richness of it even though it is difficult sometimes to grasp, but Lord, it is your holy word, and man does it speak uh, if we just have eyes to see and ears to hear. Help us, Lord, to love one another self-sacrificially, to put the needs of others before our own. And Lord, help us to walk in the light in the area of obedience. Lord, if there is unconfessed sin, I pray that right now, Lord, or throughout these days that we're here, just sitting, listening to your word, fellowshipping and, and worshiping you, Lord, convict us of sin. Bring those to light that we might forsake them and that hindrance, that stumbling block might be removed from between us. And we might come back to that light where there's no darkness, there's no hidden sins. Bring us back to that sweet, fellowship with you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. How it is you that, how you desire us to be, be there near you. It is you desire this fellowship with each and every one of us. You don't want there to be sin uh, hindering that fellowship. It is your desire that every one of us sitting here today, that you could draw us close to have that father son or father daughter uh, relationship so draw us lord we pray in jesus name amen amen